and the current news in the other hand. What does our faith have to do with the realities of the world in which we live in 2014? And what can one person's faith do, given the harsh realities of a cold and uncaring world? That's what I want you to look at with me for a few moments as we celebrate 10 years of a program that uses what Dr. Jerome Ross calls a hermeneutic for homiletics. What can one person's faith do given the realities of the world in which we live? And the lens I want you to look through this afternoon is the life and the faith of one person who is on the surface an insignificant purpose person. He does not have any letters like the apostles Paul, Peter, James, or John, his words are not immortalized or memorized like the words of scripture. Almost every Christian knows words like the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Words like though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, words like my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above words like now unto him who's able to keep you from this man whose life and faith I want you to use as a lens through which to address our question. That man's life and that man's faith on the surface seem insignificant because you can't point to any books that he wrote, books like Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. You can't point to or quote any lines from any letters he wrote to Timothy or Titus. The man I want you to look at, the person I want you to look at this afternoon did not write anything that was preserved or anything of canonical significance. He seems insignificant in the grand scheme of biblical things when you first look at him. But to me, he is a living example of how looks can be deceiving. The man I want you to look at is a man named Philip. Now, I started to break protocol, but Lisa kept calling the office. I wasn't going to give any scripture at all for this sermon. I finally broke down and gave Acts 6, verses 1 through 6. And I wasn't going to give any scripture because I want you to walk through me. I know this is a seminary, so I know you do not have any Bibles with you. <laughs> but you got smartphones. Take out your smartphone and Google. Google in the book of Acts because I want you to see some powerful scriptures that paint a powerful portrait, a portrait that is easily missed. Turn first to the passage you heard, Acts 6, 1 through 6. When the church began to grow, the church in Jerusalem, the first church, Acts 4, verse 4 says, they grew from 120 to just around 5,000. With growth comes trouble. The bigger the church, the bigger the problems. The more disciples you get, the more disagreements you get. The Greek-speaking Jews thought the Hebrew-speaking Jews were playing favorites and the folk in the faith fell out. Not folk in the club, folk in the church. Not in Chicago, but in Jerusalem. Not folk who knew Jesse Jackson, but folk who knew Jesus. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together, Acts 6, verse 2, and said in verse 3, choose seven from among you. Select seven from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Verse 5 says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip. Philip, one of the seven who had hands laid on him by the apostles in verse 6. Philip, one consecrated to be a diaconia, a servant of the church. Philip, the man whose name is mentioned right after Stephen's name. Stephen was murdered, tried on trumped up charges, and stoned to death while Saul or Paul held the coats of those who did the stoning. Philip is the man whose name is called by the evangelist Luke right after he lists and called Stephen by name, Philip. Philip also was a man full of faith and wisdom. Philip also was a man full of the Holy Spirit. That is how Luke describes him. The apostle John, evangelist John, says that Philip was the one to whom the Greeks came in the 12th chapter of John. Philip is a man also full of the Holy Spirit. Philip thought seemingly insignificant when you first look at him. Philip is a man whose faith transformed the landscape of the biblical narrative radically. Philip's faith changed the course of Christianity. Philip's faith altered the trajectory of our tradition in some awesome ways. And I want you to look with me at what this one person's faith did as you consider the limitless possibilities of what your faith can do if you keep your hand in God's hand. 
Luke does not tell us if this is the same Philip whom John says the Greeks approached in Jerusalem saying, we want to see Jesus. Luke does not tell us, nor does John, if Philip spoke Greek to these Greek worshipers at the Passover in John 12, although we know Philip is a Greek name, John says Philip was from Bethsaida. In John 1, the evangelist says the same Philip of John 12 is the one whom Jesus found in John 1, and the one to whom Jesus said, follow me. The evangelist John says the same Philip went and found Nathanael, who said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So we know that John's Philip was a student of Torah. He knew the word of God and he knew the way of God, a man full of faith. Luke doesn't tell us if this is the same Philip that John writes about. Luke does not tell us if this Philip was one of the 12 who was transformed from a cowering coward to a courageous crusader by the resurrected Christ. Running away on Thursday night when Jesus was betrayed and hiding behind a locked door in a borrowed upper room on the following Sunday when some women said he was risen from the dead, transformed from a coward hiding to a courageous herald preaching about a savior whom the sovereign had raised from the dead and put all power in his hand. Luke doesn't give us that kind of detailed information about Philip, is this the same Philip John is talking about? The same Philip whom John describes who was with Jesus from the early days in Galilee until the day of his ascension? Luke does not fill in all of those details. But in Luke's history of the early church, when Luke describes the growth of the early church, the power in the early church, the amazing inclusivity and embrace of the early church, in this Luke's second volume concerning the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles to use Freddie Haynes' phraseology, what Luke does tell us by the time we get to Acts 6 is that Philip was one of the original, what I call, Magnificent Seven. Select from among yourselves seven persons of good standing, full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. Seven selected to be diakonia, servants of the church. When the congregation in Jerusalem looked at the disciples in their number and had to decide who among them was sincere enough, who among them had both faith and wisdom, who among them had the anointing of the Holy Spirit on their lives heavy enough that they could be chosen to be like Jesus and serve diaconia and not be puffed up, arrogant, proud, and looking to be served, they chose Philip. Philip's faith qualified him for the position. Why? First point. I want to call to your attention because Philip's faith changed his life. What was he doing before Jesus came into his life? The scriptures do not say, but they do tell us that his life was changed to such an extent that the believers trusted him with the office of diaconia. They trusted him with the affairs of their congregation. They trusted him enough to share their pains and their problems with him because they knew that he could and would pray for them. How many people do you know that you can tell your show enough honest to God secrets to and not have to worry about hearing them again because you know the only person they're going to talk to about your stuff is Jesus? Philip was such a person. Philip, in my tradition, they say could get a prayer through. Philip not only knew the written word as Acts 8 shows, and we're coming to that, Philip also knew the living word. Philip's faith changed his life. It changed him from whatever he had been before to one who was worthy enough to have the apostles pray over him and lay their hands on him. Seminarians, think about where you used to be 10 years ago. Think about where you were then and look where you are today. Your faith has changed your life. I know there's still some stuff that you're wrestling with and don't think that it's just you as a member of a church or a seminarian in the church. Some deacons in the church are still wrestling with some stuff. Some preachers in God's church are still wrestling with some stuff. Some pastors in the church are still wrestling with some stuff. Every saint who is honest is still wrestling with some stuff. <laughs> what did the most prolific preacher in the first century say? When I would do good, evil is always present. The good that I want to do, I don't do. And everything I don't want to do, I end up doing it every time. Every believer still wrestles with stuff. But if you think back, stuff you're wrestling with today, 10 years ago, 
you didn't see nothing wrong with doing it. You wasn't wrestling with it. You was enjoying it. Oh, you're looking so holy. <laughs> Me and Mrs. Mrs. Jones. Yeah, you didn't see nothing wrong with that 10 years ago. Okay, this is the young crowd, Howard. Twerk, twerk, twerk. I know you want it. That was back then, but now the hymn says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. A change, Tremaine Hawkinson, has come over me. Your faith, like Philip's faith, has changed your life. Number one, Philip's faith changed his life. Point number two, Philip's faith changed the lives of others. Now, I said I didn't want to give you my scripture because I wanted you to walk through the scripture with me. If you turn to Acts, or use your phone, Acts 21, verses 8 through 10, those verses tell us that Philip's faith, write it down now so you can look it up later, Philip's faith changed the lives of his immediate family. Philip had four daughters, and because of their father's faith, all four of them, unmarried, were ministers, preachers, prophets. What they saw at home opened them up to the possibility of accepting the claim and calling God had on their lives. Philip's faith in him who said, if these hold their peace, the rocks will cry out. Philip's faith in him who said, through the prophet Joel, behold, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your wood. Daughters shall prophesy. Philip's faith in him who honored women, him who respected women, him who elevated women, him who restored women as equal citizens in the family of God. Philip's faith changed the lives of his daughters. Nobody could have told them 10 years before Calvary that they would be preaching, preachers of Christ and Christ crucified. Philip's faith changed the lives of others. First, it changed the lives of, lives of his immediate family. When I was yet in the crib, I, I told our congregation across the years that I served, I never will forget, I was in the crib and I used to wait until I thought my parents were asleep at night and climb out of my crib and climb up in their bed. And one night I got the biggest shock of my life, a lesson in life I'll never forget. As I climbed out of my crib, they weren't in their bed, they were down on their knees in prayer. And I'm saying to myself, if prayer is this important that you can do this at home away from the congregation, this must be some pretty important stuff, <laughs> this prayer business. My father said to me, if the faith you profess at home ain't working at home, then for God's sake, please do not export it. <laughs> His daughters saw the risen Christ living in their father at home. They saw the resurrected reigning and soon returning king of kings alive in their own home. And they embraced every word, every promise, and every provision. Philip's faith changed the lives of his family members. Let me ask you, has your family seen a change in your life? But beyond Philip's immediate family, look what his faith did. If you will, turn again, turn to Acts the 8th chapter, verses 4 through 8 first. I told you I want you to walk through this biblical biopic with me. Acts 8, verse 4 says, when the believers were scattered, they preached the word wherever they went. And look where Philip went. Look where Philip preached. Philip went to Samaria. Philip preached in Samaria, don't miss that. Philip went to the place Jews had been taught to avoid. Philip preached Jesus to a people Jews had been taught to hate. Just as Jewish survivors of the European Hitler's Holocaust are taught from infancy to hate Palestinians whom they do not know and whose land they illegally occupy. Jews from 700 years before Jesus have been taught to hate Samaritans they did not know. The evangelist John in John 4 says that not only don't Jews associate with Samaritans, they don't even use dishes, pots, or pans that Samaritans have used. These are the people that Philip preached Jesus to. Philip ministered in a place his people have been taught to avoid. Philip did ministry among a people his people have been taught to hate. And just look at God. Go back to the context of the text and the context in which we live for just a moment. What was my opening sentence? What can one person's faith do given the realities of the world in which that person lives? Jews were under oppression in Philip's day, just like blacks are under oppression in our days. Samaritans were under the same Roman oppression in Philip's day that the Jews were under. Rome is where? Where is Rome? And what, what country, what continent? 
Mm, go back to elementary school. Europe. <laughs> Romans are what? Italians, Europeans. Jews and Samaritans were hated by the Europeans, just like Barack Hussein Obama is hated by Ted Cruz and the Tea Party. But Philip preached Jesus in spite of the Romans. Philip preached Jesus in spite of his ethnic heritage and how he had been taught to hate the folk to whom he was preaching. And just look at God. Acts 8 verse 6 says, When the Samaritans heard Philip preaching Jesus, they, play, they paid close attention. There's something about the word of God that will get anybody's attention. There's something about the name of Jesus. Paul said, even the demons have to bow at the name of Jesus. Just look at God. Verse 7, With shrieks, evil spirits came out of people at the name of Jesus. The NRSV says unclean spirits were cast out at the name of Jesus. Just look at God. The paralyzed were asked and able to move at the name of Jesus. Cripples were healed. And the lame were able to walk at the name of Jesus. Acts 6, Philip's faith Acts to God changed in Acts 8. The lives of people possessed. It changed the lives of the paralyzed. It changed the lives of those who were lame. Philip's faith changed the lives of others. It changed the lives of others to such an extent that Luke says there was great joy in Samaria. Philip's faith changed his life and Philip's faith changed the lives of others. How many others have seen your faith and had their lives changed? But then, most importantly for me, I submit to you that as we prepare to celebrate 10 years of the Center for African American Theological Stories, ultimately, my last point, Philip's faith changed history. And because of Roman imperialism, the Roman Empire, Roman colonization, and racist historians, most of us have never been taught the African origins of Christianity, the African footprint in the story of our sacred text, and the African founders who built upon the rock of Jesus, the first four centuries of the development of Christian theologies, the monastic life and the spiritual disciplines of prayer and meditation, I submit to you, they can all be traced back to this passage right here in Acts 8, where Philip's faith changed the course of history. Now, you know this passage by heart, but just turn to it again, if you will. Acts 8, verse 26, there was an African official in the court of Queen Kentike. We call her Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, the queen of the south. This African official was the secretary of the treasury. He was in charge of all the money in the country and in the reign of the queen of the south. This African official was a member of the people who call themselves Beta Israel, second Israel. Alpha being the first Israel, the people of Beta Israel. Today's journalists and European writers call them Falasha, but Falasha to a Beta Israelite is a dirty word like the N word to them. Their history they take and trace back to almost a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. They trace their origins back to the days of King Solomon, David's son, and his having a baby boy by the then Queen of the South, Queen Makeda. Ethiopia, incidentally, and Ethiopian are not the names they call themselves or the places where they lived. The Greek colonizers gave them those names, just like the Greek colonizers changed the name of or gave a new name to the country where Moses grew up. The natives of that country called the land Chemet, Chemet, Chemet. The Hebrews called the land Mitzrayim. The Greeks changed the name to Egyptos. And we've called it Egypt ever since. The colonizers changed the name. The people of Beta Israel called themselves Cushites or Nubians, like Moses' wife was. The Greek colonizers changed their name to Aetiop, burnt face, Aetiop, black face, Aetiop, Ethiopia, the land of black people. Well, Makeda, the queen of the burnt skin people, had heard of Solomon, heard of his wealth, heard of his wisdom, one of her merchants. A trusted businessman brought her back stories of Solomon's wealth and Solomon's wisdom. So Makeda went to see for herself. She came back in awe. She came back in reverence, but she also came back pregnant. 
She gave birth to Solomon's son, and his name was Menelik. At the age of 12, 13, she sent him up to Jerusalem to be bar mitzvah, and he came back and brought Judaism back with him with some priests into Ethiop, the land of the black. There had been Ethiopian Jews since the time of Solomon. That's why this Ethiopian Jew in Acts 8 had been to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh in the temple of Solomon. That's why the Ethiopian Jew was reading Isaiah 53 in Greek on his way back home to the home of the burnt skin, black skin people. And when the spirit spoke to Philip and told him to run up next to the chariot, Philip's obedience, Philip's faith, changed the history of our faith forever. Ethiopian Christians, both the Orthodox Ethiopian, Orthodox Egyptian, and the Coptic church have been in existence since the early part of the first century of the common era. Abuna Paulus, the patriarch of the Coptic church, a decade ago, bragged to the study group that I was leading to Ethiopia as he welcomed us home that they had been burnt skin believers, Christians since the year after the resurrection. Philip's faith changed the history of our faith. Africans were Christians 300 years before Europeans were. Thomas Oden, a white scholar, because some of y'all don't believe nothing unless you see a white person who wrote it. Thomas Oden. <laughs> And countless African scholars all point out that the African theologians, Tertullian, African, Athanasius, African, Augustine, African, Theophilus of Antioch, African, and both Origen and Clement of Alexandria in Africa formed the foundation of the faith that we know today because one person's faith caused an Ethiopian, a member of the house of Beta Israel, an African Jew, a black-faced, burnt-faced, Greek-reading member of the cabinet of Candace to hear the story of Jesus. Reverend William Oliver and Dr. Mokele Madise of the University of South Africa argue that it was the faith of another one person, Mark, who established a theological school and the church in Egypt that caused the formation of Christian theology in Alexandria. One person's faith can change history, secular history and sacred history. Geschichte. Philip preached unto the Ethiopian in verse 35, the story of Jesus and the African Jew became an African Christian that day, according to Luke. One person's faith can transform history. Now, Philip did not know that his faith would change history, just like you do not know. You have no idea what being true to your faith will mean to others in 100 or 150 or 200 or 1,000 years from now. But your job is not to know. Your task is to bear witness, to tell the story, to serve and tell the story, to do ministry and tell the story, and leave the results up to God. Be faithful, God says, unto death, and God will give you a crown of life. So since we do not know what your faith will do or how God will use your faith to bless this world, to change others, or to change the world and change history, let's just thank God in advance for what God is going to do through you, one person. Come on and let's sing together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Eternal God, bless this word as your people who prepare themselves for ministry, people already engaged in ministry, go out to tell the story. Living the faith they preach about. We do ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. I just want to thank Would you stand to your feet Thank you Lord Thank you Lord Thank you Lord Thank you just want to thank has God been good to anybody besides me come on sing been so good been so good put a smile on your face when you sing it you look like you've been sucking on lemons been so good good God has been so good been so good I just want to thank you. I just...
want to thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of God's countenance upon you and grant you God's peace henceforth now and forevermore. Let all the people of God together say, Amen.